Hey, hey, what's up, y'all? Welcome to Marathon 120. I'm so glad you clicked on the video. I don't really have anything to say before this one. I kind of like having things to say now and then. I will say this on our Teespring store, we've still got a 10% discount through the end of the day Monday. Monday being Cyber Monday, you can use the code Dixie10 at checkout to buy t shirts. Christmas is coming up. If you guys want to order some t shirts for your friends, that's fine. I mean, that's great, actually, if you did. But I wanted to let you know that I'm seeing a lot, a lot of t-shirts being bought and people aren't using that discount code. If you buy $40 worth of stuff, it's four bucks off. I mean, take advantage of that discount. Dixie 10 at checkout gets you 10% off. Other than that, that's all I have to say. Happy Thanksgiving and let's get rolling with this video. All right, here we go. Here's an email from Mark, and this is a great story. I think you guys are going to like it. Here's what he writes. I live in southeastern Kentucky. My family has lived here for a hundred years. I remember hearing my grandparents telling stories about Bigfoot. They called it something else, but now I know what they were referring to. For some reason, I thought it was connected somehow to illegal moonshining in the hills. My experiences started at a time that we had recently begun stocking a pond on our property. I had been catching catfish on trot lines and bush hooks and then dumping them in the pond. I had made a cage to easily transfer the fish to the pond. I would fish one day and I'd leave my catch in this cage at the river and then I'd transport the cage full of fish to the pond on the next day. Several days in a row, I would check my cage and the fish I had left there the day before would be gone. Someone was stealing them. I wanted to catch them. I headed to the river right at daylight the next morning. There was a trail that we had worn and it was the path we always took. When I got to where I could see the river, I could not believe what I was seeing. Right there on the bank was a real live Bigfoot, and he was holding a big catfish in his big hand. Its back was turned towards me, and it had not seen me. I stopped, and I stood still and just watched. It's hard to explain how enormous these creatures are. It had to have been eight feet tall and no way to know its weight, but I would guess it weighed 600 pounds. It was covered in brown and red hair. I don't know how long I stood there and watched, probably just seconds, and it continued to reach for fish in the cage, and it still didn't know I was there. I started to back away, but it was a long way for me to get to the point that he couldn't see me. I felt hopeless, but I took two steps backwards anyway. I had to do something. That's when I heard the distinct sound of a rattle behind me. Of all the things I didn't need to happen was to have my escape route blocked by a rattlesnake. But here I stood in the middle of that trail exposed with a giant in front of me and a rattlesnake behind me. Of course I stopped and thought about which would be worse, a snake bite or a Bigfoot attack. The giant heard the snake and he turned. I'm sure he was surprised to see me. He was so surprised to see me that he roared at me. It scared me to death, but I stood there as still as I could manage. I closed my eyes and I thought about my wife and children. How are they going to make it without me? It roared again, bringing my thoughts back to the problem at hand, and I opened my eyes. He dropped the big fish and he picked up a rock and he threw it. Immediately, I shut my eyes and I got ready for the impact, but the rock landed beside me. He had thrown the rock and hit that snake. I saw it scurry off in the leaves. When I looked back at the giant, I saw fury in his eyes as it picked up another rock from the bank. He was looking at me now, and I knew where that next rock was going. And when he slung it at me, I ducked and I heard it zoom where my head was a second before. 
I was now free to back up, and I started walking backwards at a pretty good pace. I stumbled here and there, but I was putting distance between him and me. Every foot gained to me a little bit of hope. The entire time I backed away, this thing leaned over at the waist, looking me dead in the eyes and snarling and growling at me. But it didn't reach for another rock. I think it was letting me go. And then the creature turned and he picked up my cage and tucked it under his arm and he walked across that river, up the other bank, and he stopped to watch me back up that hill. It never took its eyes off of me until we couldn't see each other. I think I got lucky. I got home and I told my wife. She asked if I'd been into my grandfather's moonshine. Later that week, I showed her the tracks that that thing had been leaving while robbing my cage. We both heard howls during that summer, and we still hear them today. That thing is still here. It took me several months to go back to the river again, and I'm still cautious when I go. I now know these things are real, and my grandparents' stories were true. Oh, Mark, that's an awesome story. Man, I really appreciate that. Good grief. You were in a bind, brother. You were in a bind, but you did the right thing. You backed up, kept your cool, got back to your wife and kids, and everything worked out good. I appreciate the story. You did a great job writing it, and I know we all enjoyed it. Thanks, Mark. Here's an email from Corey. Corey writes, I wanted to share one of my many encounters with Bigfoot. This is the one that changed my life. Let me start off with some information about me. I'm a lifetime hunter and outdoorsman and just a good old country boy. Well, really? Big old country boy. Up until what I'm about to tell you, only one thing scared me, and that was my five-foot-tall red-headed mother when she was mad. I consider myself a big man. I'm six foot four and 280 pounds and by no means weak, and I also have a bad temper. But enough of that and on with the story. I live in western North Carolina in the Blue Ridge Mountains. I've lived here my whole life, and I spent most of my life back in those mountains. I've seen bear and coyotes and deer, all the animals that we have. We also have bobcats and mountain lions. I've seen and heard all of them, and I've killed all except a mountain lion. In late November of 2016, I was deer hunting alone miles away from anyone or any road and absolutely no cell signal. Walkie-talkies don't even work back in there. I was sitting at a big oak tree, and behind me was a steep rock cliff. I've tried climbing up this cliff before, and I never made it 10 feet. All that morning, I hadn't seen anything, not even a bird, which was odd. Around 11 that morning, I was getting hungry. After I ate my lunch, I started hearing loud claps, like rocks being clapped together. It was coming from a spring 300 yards off to my left. I couldn't see over there for all the mountain laurel and ivy, but it made me uneasy, so I flicked the safety off my Remington 270. No one but my father, brother, and me hunt there. None of them would slip up there to mess with me, so I just kept an eye on this area. The noises kept on for about an hour or so, and I was thinking another hunter was trespassing on me. I was more angry than I was afraid. I stood up, and when I did, there was a loud thud at the top of the cliff. I scanned the area through my scope, and I caught a flash of something black. It was fast, and it was too big to be a bear. The rock clacking was getting louder and more aggressive. This couldn't be another human. Why would he be making all this noise? And then all hell broke loose. Whatever was up there started coming down, and it was grabbing trees, slowing itself down off that cliff. No human was going to come down this bluff sounding like that. It was an animal of some kind, and I didn't know if it was a predator or what, so I got ready to shoot. It finally came into view a short distance away. It was twice the size of a man and totally covered in black hair or fur. It was coming right at me. 
I centered up on its chest and I took a shot, putting a 270 round into its center mass. That stopped it for a minute, but it didn't drop to the ground. It seemed stunned, and that gave me time to drop out of my stand and start running. Now you might ask why I didn't shoot again. I wasn't sure what it was, and I wasn't interested in killing it now if I didn't have to. But once I started running, I wished I had emptied my magazine into this thing because it started chasing me. It was grunting and making horrible noises. I think the bullet in its chest slowed him down enough to give me a chance, though, to make it to the truck. I made it to the truck, and I got in, and I shut the door, and I saw it only a few yards away from me. It had stopped in the tree line, and it was pissed. I started the engine, and I went real fast all the way home. I didn't stop until I got to the driveway. This is the first time I have told the whole story. Other people have heard the watered-down version of me having only a sighting. I've been afraid to tell anyone I shot it. I didn't go back to the area that year, but I have hunted there every year since and have had no other incidents. However, when I do hunt there, the load that I carry is not just for deer hunting. Along with my two seventy deer rifle, I carry a light AK-47 with two 40 round magazines plus a 45 ACP 1911. If I run up on this thing again, I will not hold back. I think they are very aggressive, and an unarmed human has no chance if they encounter one that wants to kill you. P.S. I'm not a good rider, but I did my best. I'm a mechanic, and so I listen to podcasts all day, and I've listened to all your videos many times. I appreciate that you don't ridicule people and call them crazy. That's exactly why you got this whole story. Well, Corey, I think you're crazy. You're, you are, you're the only one I think is crazy. (laughs) I'm just kidding, man. You're, you're only half crazy. I'm, I'm the other half crazy. I thought this was a good story because this guy understands that these things can be aggressive and he's armed up. So the next time he gets out there and this thing starts to come at him or whatever, I mean, he's got 80 rounds of a virtually a, a seven. A, say, what is it? Okay, everybody's gonna go crazy because I can't get this right. It's a 762 39 millimeter, I think, is what an AK 47. I made that mistake in another video a year and a half ago, and I still, all the gun people still have to tell me, no, it's not a 556, five, it's a 762. It was just the slip of the tongue. I actually understand what those rounds are, but I get them jumbled up when I talk, and I don't know why. But I think an AK-47 shoots a 7.16 39mm. Go ahead and leave a thousand comments if I'm wrong. You know, everybody needs to put me in my place. (laughs) But anyway, Corey, that's a great story, man, and we all enjoyed it. Thanks for sending it, and I'm glad you shared with us the whole story, brother. Appreciate you. This gentleman doesn't tell me whether to use his name or not, so I'm just not going to. But uh, how about this? The first letter of his name is M. That's going to get you pretty close to who he is. Uh, Here's what he writes. On November 21st, 2001, a couple of friends and I went on a deer hunting trip to Monroe County, West Virginia. We had a little cabin at a place called Potts Mountain close to a town called Waitsville. The location is in the Jefferson National Forest. We hunted all morning with no luck. That evening, I ventured to a place I had not been before. I found a spot under a big maple and I settled in. After an hour, I noticed that it was really quiet except for a light breeze. All I could hear were acorns dropping. A few were hitting close to me and one actually hit me in my boot. I looked up in the tree to see where they were coming from, and that's when I noticed that I was not under any oak trees. The closest oak tree was several yards away. The wind swirled, and I caught a horrible odor, a mix of sewage and skunk. A feeling of dread came over me, and I didn't know why. Another acorn came flying in, and I saw the direction that it had come from. It had been thrown at me. It had not dropped from a tree. I kept watch on the area where I saw the thing come from, and I swore that I saw a face staring back at me. 
Immediately, I assumed it was one of my buddies, and I yelled out at them, thanking them sarcastically for ruining my hunt. I got no answer, so I yelled out again, telling them that this was a good way to get themselves shot. No answer again, and this thing stood there and stared at me. From my perspective, it looked like a big man in a dark coat with a ski mask on, wearing wraparound sunglasses. Finally, I lifted my rifle and I looked through the scope, and it wasn't a man. It was something that I had never seen before. Its yellow eyes stood out against the black fur, and they looked angry, and I began to tremble. I wanted to take a shot, but I only had four rounds in my bolt rifle. Something about its size made me think that I couldn't kill it with four rounds, even if I had time to get four off. By this time, I was terrified and shaking even worse, but I held my eye to the scope. It opened its mouth, and I saw its white yellow teeth. They were huge teeth, and he had large canines or fangs. It huffed several times, and then it screamed at me, and it started moving, giving me a clear view of its body. It had been crouching in the brush watching me, but now it stood seven or eight feet tall, and I bet you it weighed 500 pounds. And then it stopped, and it looked at me, showing those vicious teeth, and then it turned and ran away from me, tearing up everything in its path. Not just casually going through the forest, It was intentionally tearing up everything it touched. When I knew it was gone, I got out of there as fast as I could. My buddy was making coffee at the camp when I got back. The sun had gone down. I told him that I had seen a bear. He asked me why I hadn't killed it. I just said I didn't have a clear shot. I guess if I had told him what really happened, I would have been called crazy. So I kept it to myself. Until now, I cannot imagine looking across a short distance in the forest and out of nowhere seeing something in the brush looking at me that big. I cannot imagine the terror that would go through me. And then to lift your rifle scope and to have it just fill your your field of view and to be able to see yellow eyes against black fur and white yellowish teeth with big fangs or canines. It's just, it's an insane, scary story. I think I kind of know why he hasn't told everybody the whole story so far, because you probably would get razzed pretty bad by your buddies. But I'm glad you shared it with us, and we really appreciate it. And there's no ribbon here, buddy. I mean, we we appreciate the story. So listen, thanks for sending that to me. You did a great job writing it, and we all enjoyed it, I'm sure. Thanks, buddy. Here's an email from Mike. I had a night encounter along a deserted stretch of rural roads surrounded by the Pennsylvania State game lands. No houses, camps, etc. for miles either way. I was driving home from a Christmas dinner with relatives. I don't drink, so no alcohol was involved at any point. We had been seeing deer along this stretch of the road. I slowed down as I traveled that area so that I might have time to react and not hit the deer. I had just seen a doe standing next to the road, so I slowed down and I put my high beams on. It was starting to snow, but the roads hadn't become too bad yet, but they were slippery in some spots. I had traveled a half a mile from the last deer when suddenly a young yearling half skidded half fell across the road 40 yards in front of me, landing in a heap in the center of the yellow line. I stood on my brakes and I came to a stop just 15 yards from this deer with my high beam still on. I could hear it squalling like young deer do when they are in distress. Out of nowhere, a huge creature leapt off the bank on the upper side of the road and scooped the deer up in his left arm like a linebacker scoops up a fumbled football. He took his huge right hand, which completely encompassed the deer's head, and snapped its neck with a quick twist. The deer quit squalling and went limp in the grip of this monster. I was aghast. 
The bank went downhill on the lower side of the road and he leapt from the center lines and went out of sight down the hill. He had to have covered 30 feet in a single standing leap. He was easily four or five feet across at the shoulders and three feet thick chest to back. I didn't believe in Bigfoot before this, but I do now. It looked black, but you could see dark auburn red reflections in the headlights. I know my Pennsylvania mammals, and I've hunted and trapped for over 35 years. This creature was eight foot tall, easily, even being bent over slightly at the waist. His palms were 10 to 12 inches square, and he must have weighed 550 pounds minimum. There was a brow, and his eyes were a few inches back from its nose. There was no hair from brow to just below the lower lip. There were rounded canines in the upper left jaw, and I couldn't see the right. He was slightly quartering away from me. He had been so intent on bagging his meal, he largely ignored me sitting in my car only 15 yards away until he was leaving. He turned at the waist and slightly let out a growl that I felt as much as I heard. At one time, I was a roadie for rock bands and I ran mixers. I was very familiar with reverb and feedback. It felt something like that. I took the growl as a warning. You didn't see me and never try to find me. I was good with that and it took several minutes for me to regain my composure and start driving again. I still go out hunting, but I'll leave those particular game lands to my furry hunting friends. Oh, that's where I, that's, I've said it a hundred times. That's where I want to see one from the safety of my car. And it would be best if he jumped right out in front of me, just like he did with you. Mike, I bet you wish you had a dash cam when that happened, man. You would have, <laughs> you would have the video of the century with your high beams on. And I mean, it, you, you, you saw so many details that he was really close to you. And I think a camera would have picked up a great shot of that. This is an awesome story, and I think it's the kind of encounter most people would prefer to have. Thank you for sending it to us, and we all appreciate it. The person who wrote this email wants to leave their name out of it, and here's what they wrote. I've debated several times whether to share my experiences or not. I really don't care if someone believes me. I was there, and they weren't. I still have family in this area and in this county where this occurred, so I'd like to be unnamed. I was born in the volunteer state of Tennessee. We lived in a rural area until I was eight and when dad moved the family to a larger city in search of a better job. My mom's parents lived in the same county that I was born in and my dad's parents lived in the next county over. Every couple of weeks after we moved, we would return to see my grandparents on the weekends. We would go see my maternal grandparents first. They had a small farm with a big pond that I caught many fish from. My paternal grandparents had a 90-acre place. It had belonged to my great-great-grandparents and was down in a holler far from the main road. Over the years, it had been handed down through generations. I think it had started out as a 600-acre farm, but it's since been divided up among the family. This land is where my story took place. My grandparents didn't have indoor plumbing until I was in my teens. The reason I mention this is because it's part of the story. After a lunch, I would go out and wander around. I remember it happening three different times while I was out roaming. I would be admiring God's handiwork and a rock would land near me or I'd hear a whistle. I always chalked it up to one of my cousins messing with me. A few other times I would get a whiff of old sewage, nothing too strong, and I always figured the smell came from someone using the outhouse. When I was 19, I had a 10-day leave from the Marine Corps. Deer season was open and luckily there was a rain system moving through. I figured if I timed it right, I could get to my grandparents' place a little before the rain stopped. You know, deer won't move when it's raining or windy as they can't hear over the wind and the rain. I got there about 3 a.m. and I headed to my old deer stand that I had built on an old white oak. 
The rain was starting to let up and I was excited because I knew the deer would be up from their beds and ready to feed soon. After an hour, I heard something that sounded like gibberish. It was far enough away that I couldn't make out any words. My grandpa would let anyone hunt if they asked, so I figured it was other hunters. The gibberish subsided after a few minutes. It was still dark, so I tried to be still until it was light enough to see where the others were. Then I got a whiff of a strong, raw sewage. I thought whoever I'd heard earlier was using the bathroom. Then I heard a sound that took me back to being 10 years old. It was a low growl. I broke out in a cold sweat. One time when I was 10, I got up during the night to go to the outhouse. I had just opened the front door and stepped out on the porch when I heard a growl. Instantly, Grandpa was behind me with his shotgun. He told me to go inside, and when we went back inside, I was so frightened that I didn't need to go to the outhouse for a while. Granny got me a chamber pot so I could do my business inside. I asked Grandpa what had made that sound, and he said it was a wampus cat. I'd heard of wampus cats for years, but I had never seen one. The next morning before breakfast, I took the chamber pot out to empty it. I made a wide circle around the side of the house where I heard the noises, and I didn't notice anything out of the ordinary, so I forgot about it. When I heard the growl while hunting, I froze and I waited nervously for daylight. As soon as it was light enough, I got out of the tree stand and I made some noise so if anyone else was around, they would hear me and not mistake me for a deer. I quickly walked to my truck and then I drove down to my grandparents' house. The house was a cabin that my great-great-grandfather had built. Over the years, they had added those old shingles for siding and finally added indoor plumbing. And as usual, my grandpa was sitting in his chair in the living room. As soon as he saw me on the porch, he did his usual invite. Come on in, boy. How you doing? Want a cup of coffee? We were glad to see each other. Granny brought me a cup of coffee and a biscuit. She stayed busy in the kitchen, and my grandpa and I sat there drinking our coffee. He asked me what was wrong, and I asked how he knew something was wrong, and he said he always knew when something was wrong with me. I told him about what had happened, and he told me that it wasn't a wampus cat, that they don't exist. In that area, they call them Whistling Pete, or boogers. He told me of how they would come through that area from time to time like they were migrating or something. They would come around and taking livestock. I asked if I could do something to help. He told me whenever they thought one was around, they would stay inside mostly. They didn't seem to hang around but for a week or two. I asked why they never told any of us grandkids about this, and Grandpa said they usually didn't bother people and they didn't want to scare us, not to worry because they would be fine. After a while, I said my goodbyes and I drove up to see my parents. I told my father about what had happened. He said that they would be out plowing and the old mule would stop and start staring. He said they would look at the tree line and sometimes get a glimpse of one of those things. He said they never bothered them and they just seemed to be curious. I told him that the one I heard and smelled didn't seem to be curious. It had a mean feel to it. That's the feeling I had up in the tree stand. A few years later, my grandpa passed away and we moved Granny to another house. After we got her moved in, it was just her and me, and she started to talk to me in a serious manner like she had never done before. She said she wanted me to promise not to go down to the old house by myself ever again. She said more than one of them had come back, and these were not the nice creatures. They would pound on the outside of the house and shake the windows and the doors. She said that she thought there were at least three of them. She would call one of her sons that lived a few miles away, and as soon as they heard his truck, they would stop. I told her I needed to go and get an old tractor Grandpa had given me years before. It didn't run, but I was going to take it home and rebuild it. It was getting late when I stopped at one of my cousin's house and asked if I could borrow his trailer to haul that tractor. 
Grandpa had given him an old car, and he needed to get that car moved to his house. So we made plans for me to come down the next Saturday and load both of them up. I got up early the next Saturday, and I made the trip. And when he came out to get in the truck, he asked if I had my rifle. I reminded him of all the rattlesnakes that we had killed over the years, not telling him that I was armed for another reason. We got to the old place and had backed up to get the old tractor first. We hadn't been out of the truck long before I heard what sounded like an owl. My cousin asked why an owl would hoot in broad daylight. I told him it was probably someone hunting turkeys and trying to get an old tom to gobble. Seconds later, a rock flew past us and it landed in front of the house. I knew then what it was. We were looking around, and from up on the ridge came a whistle that sounded like an old steam locomotive. There was an old corn crib across the branch that you cross by, an old log footbridge. I told my cousin to grab my rifle, and we flanked the corn crib. As we were crossing the bridge, another rock was thrown. This one hit me in the cheek, and it drew blood. I've got a temper, and it's gotten me in trouble before. I could tell my cousin was worried, and I was just pissed off. Another rock flew past us, and at the same time we heard the owl hoot come from two different places, and then the train whistle up on the ridge only closer this time. I had unholstered my revolver, and I said a few choice words as I cocked the hammer back. We flanked the corn crib, and what happened next is frozen in my mind. Out from behind the corn crib on the side that I was on came a creature. It had a rock above its head, and he was about to throw it at me. I pointed the revolver in his direction, and I squeezed the trigger while I ducked. I heard the rock land close to me. The creature roared in pain, and by the time I looked up, it was almost up the ridge. I didn't think that I could hit it, but I shot in its direction anyway. There were two roars that came from the ridge and another from behind the house. My cousin begged me to get us out of there. We wasted no time getting into my truck and leaving. We hit the nearby road and I drove till I got to the church down the road. I pulled over but dared not turn the engine off. My cousin and I were both pale and shaking. I finally managed to ask my cousin if he'd known anything about these creatures. He shook his head and he said that he hoped he was having a nightmare and that he would wake up soon. I told him he wasn't dreaming and we both began to calm down. He didn't make a sound as I drove him home. He sat there looking down at the floorboard the whole way. He didn't seem to realize he was safe at home for a couple of minutes. He came to himself after a little and started to get out about the time that I got the trailer unhitched. After we said our goodbyes, he looked at me and he said, I want you to promise me that you're not going back there. I don't want you there alone, and I don't want that old car either. I told him that I wouldn't go back right then, but I couldn't promise about later. I had a long drive back home, and after a few miles, I started thinking of a plan. I called some guys that I was in the Marine Corps with and set up a meeting at a local bar. I was very apprehensive about how they would receive my story. We met, and after a short time, I began to tell them my story. They sat and listened quietly, and when I finished, one of them asked me what the punchline was. He thought I was joking. My other buddy said that I believe you. The first guy looked at us, and he said, you're both nuts. My other buddy said, in all the years that we'd known each other, We had never lied to one another. We were known to joke with each other, but we didn't lie to each other. My disbelieving buddy looked at our other buddy and said, Okay, what's your story? He said, I've never seen one, but my grandfather told me stories about them. One had harassed his family when he was young, and they had to move away, that they would kill livestock of any kind. I asked if they would be willing to go back with me and help me get the tractor the following Saturday. They both agreed. I think my one buddy still thought I was pulling his leg, and our other buddy was in on it. Luckily, one of them had a trailer, so I picked them up and we headed out the following Saturday. I was thankful that both of them had brought their weapons with them. 
We stopped at a little market about 15 miles from the farm. I filled up with gas and we went inside to grab a bite to eat and a cup of coffee. As I paid for the gas and food, a guy working at the counter said it looked like we were loaded for bear. My unbelieving buddy said no, these two were hunting for Bigfoot, and I'm just along for the joke, and the worker got a strange look on his face. He handed me back my credit card, and as I signed the receipt, he took notice of my name. He asked if I had kin that lived in the area, and I said I did, and I told him where we were headed. He just said, y'all be real careful down there. I thanked him, and we started on our way. Later, as I was just about to turn down the driveway, I noticed a truck behind me. There wasn't much traffic on that road, so another vehicle was hard to miss. The truck followed us down to my grandparents' old house. It was a game warden. He got out and approached us and asked, I hear you're hunting Bigfoot. You guys have a hunting license? I took a minute to absorb what he had asked me. He asked what we were doing, and I told him that I was going to just load a tractor, and I'd brought my buddies along for help. He said the guy at the store had called and asked him to check on us. I could tell he was concerned about something, but I couldn't put my finger on it. He pitched in and he helped us and we had the tractor loaded in no time. I told the game warden I appreciated his help and that I felt bad that he felt like he needed to babysit us. The game warden looked at me and he asked what had happened to me before. I told him about what I had experienced at different times on the farm. My disbelieving buddy asked the game warden if he had ever heard as much crap as I was spewing. The warden looked at us and said if we ever repeated what he was about to say, that he would deny every word. He and another warden were patrolling the area one day and they noticed some buzzards circling. They came down to investigate as they suspected someone was killing deer out of season. They had parked in front of my grandparents' old place and they walked up on the ridge towards the buzzards. As they got to the top of the ridge, they could see something laying on the other side of the fence on my dad's cousin's land. They went to investigate, and they discovered it was what was left of a bull. Something had killed it and had only eaten the intestines. The kill was fresh. He caught a strong odor, and he told the other warden that they should head back. As they were going back to their truck, they heard two loud knocks followed by a loud whoop. About the time they were crossing the old footbridge, they heard what sounded like the whistle of an old steam train. Then they had a rock thrown in. My disbelieving buddy had gotten a look of concentration on his face as the warden told the story. He asked the warden what had happened next. He said he went to tell Dad's cousin about his bull, and he went to the office to make some calls. He looked at me and said I shouldn't have any more trouble there. I shook his hand and I thanked him. We got to our respective trucks and started back. As he turned onto the road, the game warden turned the other way. My disbelieving buddy said I kept expecting to see a guy jump out from behind something in a monkey suit. You guys are serious, aren't you? I didn't even answer him, and our other buddy said that he knew Granddad wasn't making something up. I made sure to stop at the store, and I thanked the guy for his concern, and we went to my house and unloaded the tractor. Years later, I was at the yearly cleanup at the cemetery where my grandparents and parents and aunts and uncles are buried. It used to be part of the original farm, and my great-great-grandparents had given some land for a church in a cemetery. My cousin that had the encounter with me was there. He had not said anything to me about it since it had happened. After we got through with the cleanup, we went inside to the church to have lunch from the home cooking the ladies had brought. I noticed my dad's cousin talking to a gray-haired man that looked familiar. After we had eaten and the people began to drift towards home, the gray-haired man approached me, and as he got close, I recognized him as the game warden. He asked me to step outside for a moment. My dad's cousin was already outside waiting for us. I had an inkling of what was about to go on, so I called for my cousin to join us. 
He said that he was afraid to tell me years earlier as he was still on the job and didn't want to lose it. He filled my cousin in on everything up to the time where he had helped with the tractor. He said after he had informed my dad's cousin about the bull, he went to the office and made some phone calls. There was a certain agency that they were supposed to call whenever there was a problem. The next day, 12 heavily armed men showed up and he filled them in on what he knew. He didn't know about my cousins and my encounter at the time. They had killed three of them, and one of them looked like it had been wounded earlier by the way it tried to raise its right arm. My dad's cousin chimed in and said that he had heard the shooting from his house. It sounded like the 4th of July. My cousin spoke up and asked, what happened to the bodies? The warden said the bodies had been loaded into a truck and taken to an unknown location. He was warned by the leader of the team not to ever say a word about what he had seen. He got the impression that the team had done this before. He was at the age now where he didn't care about what anybody threatened him with, and he went on to say that he knew the mystery of all this had eaten us up for years, especially my dad's cousin. I'd heard these stories through the years and had brushed them aside, but that day my world was turned upside down. I told him there was something about his story that bothered me. He looked at me questionably. I said, what made you go back into the truck the day you found the bull without investigating? He said, do you remember the boy at the store when you stopped? I said, yeah, I remember him. The warden said, well, that's my son. Your grandfather told him that he could fish any time he wanted. He was going to go fishing with a buddy of his and they came in the back way. They ran into two of these things, and they heard a third one. I told them I was glad that they weren't hurt, and the warden looked at me and said, They were hurt all right. My daughter-in-law says he still has nightmares to this day about the hairy boogers chasing them. It affected the other boy much worse as he took his own life. I didn't know what to say. I shook his hand, and I thanked him again. I never saw him again until I went to his visitation. I spoke to his son, and I told him about how good a man his father was. All the others have passed on also. Although my cousin and I saw each other many times over the years, mainly at funerals, we never spoke of any of it ever again. I'm getting older myself now these days, and like I said before, I'm not going to beg anyone to believe me. I have a few theories from over the years. I agree with my grandfather that the southern Bigfoot have a sort of migration and they don't spend much time in the same place. I also believe the reason we hear more stories about them being more aggressive is that the gene pool is shrinking or staying the same. There's more inbreeding causing genetic flaws. The only thing I can think of that accounts for the differences in the way they smell is I compare them to a dog or a goat. You know how a dog or a goat smells worse when it's wet? I've heard that's one of the theories of the Florida's skunk ape. I'll take the memory of that gray-faced, chestnut-colored thing with a rock poised to hit me with it to my grave. I know there are people that have reported that they have found them to be gentle creatures. As for me, I think my days in the woods are long behind me. But if I ever see another one, I'll do my best to put it on a slab to prove to the world that they exist. Man, what a story. I mean, this goes from when this fella is young, and it's like this odyssey of experiences from on his end, all the way up to the game warden, finding out about teams coming in, killing these things in the South. It's, it's a spectacular story. And I I don't know, there's nothing really I can add to it, but it's just an intriguing set of circumstances that, oh man, this may be one of them. I actually, I don't listen to many of my videos after I put them out, but I may listen to this one again because it's, because it's such a good story and I hope I did it justice. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoyed this story. It was a great story and all five of these stories are great. Thank you for listening this far and we'll see you guys on the next video. Thank you.